In this example, we are looking to determine the state space representation of this circuit. The input here is IA, there is a current being applied there, and the output is the voltage VL across this inductor. We have two inductors, a capacitor and a resistor. For the state space representation, the first question is what are the state variables? Take a minute to determine which state variables you would choose for this specific circuit. Again, a good first attempt is to look at elements in the circuit that can store energy. In this particular circuit, we have three elements that can store energy. We have two inductors that will store energy in the form of a magnetic field, and that depends on the current through these inductors. And we have one capacitor that will store energy in the form of an electrical field. And that energy depends on the voltage across that capacitor. So a good choice for the state variables would be the current through these inductors and the voltage across the capacitor. So let's define now the current through the inductor here. Let's call this I2. Let's call the current through this inductor here I1. This is L1, so I1, L2, I2. Let's call the voltage across this capacitor Vc. And let's define the current through the capacitor as uh, Ic, pointing downwards. We can now define our state variables as the current through the inductor here and there, and the voltage across the capacitor. So let's call our state variables x. And you're going to call then, going this way, the first element here is I2, the second element is Vc, and the last element is I1. The current across this inductor, the voltage across this capacitor, and the current across the other inductor. Very well. The first step is done. Now we need to find equations for the derivative of this state. Remember that we're looking for the state space representation. And this will be done in the form of x equals dot equals to ax plus b times u. u is the input, which in this case is ia. What do we see here? We see x dot, which is a function of x itself. So we now need to come up with three equations, one for i2, one for vc, one for i1, that will follow this format, where we have the derivative of i2 will be a function of all other states. The derivative of Vc, a function of all states. The derivative of I1, a function of the, all the other states. And it is also important to note that these equations will be the derivative of these state variables. They only depend on the states. They do not depend on the derivative of the states. So we need to also ensure that the equations that are going to develop now will follow the same format as here. So that will make everything easier than when we have to put everything in a matrix form. Okay, so let's start. Now let's start by looking for an equation that gives us the derivative of the first state I2 as a function of other states. What can we conclude here? Can we somehow link I2 and Vc, for example? Or can we link I2 and I1 and Vc? Well, clearly, it would be easy here to link I2 and Vc because the voltage across the inductor and the voltage across the capacitor are exactly the same. What is the voltage across the inductor? The voltage across the inductor, L2, is L2 di2 dt. And the voltage across the capacitor is simply Vc. Couldn't be easier than that. Now we have di2 over dt equals to 1 over L2 times Vc. Here we have the expression we need for I2. I2, the derivative of I2 is a function of other states. If we call this vector here x1, x2, and x3, so I2 is x1, Vc is x2, I1 is x3. How can you rewrite this expression? Now we have x1 dot equals to 1 over L2 times Vc. Vc becomes x2. And here we have the first equation needed for this manipulation. 
Now let's look at Vc. We need a similar expression. We need the derivative of Vc equals to a function of other states. Now let's think about this problem. We want something that depends on the derivative of Vc because that's one of our states. What is that? What is something that is proportional to the derivative of a voltage in a capacitor? Well, that's the current through the capacitor. So let's now relate IC and VC. IC is not one of our states. VC is. We can write that the current through this capacitor, IC, is C times dV C dt. Aha. Here is the derivative of VC. The derivative of the second state. Now, what is IC? IC is not one of our states. We need to get rid of it. It's an internal variable. We can relate IC with, to I2, to I1, and to the input IA. That's easy. We can just look at the current at this node A here and do the sum of all currents at node A. What do we have? We have the current going in, that is IA, and this is equal to all other currents coming out of that node, that is I2 plus I1 plus IC. Now notice that this equation is very helpful because the only thing here that we can't use is IC, and this is exactly what you want to replace there. I a is the input, I2 and I1 are states. Perfect. Now IC is simply IA minus I1 minus I2. We can now replace this here. And we'll end up with DVC DT equals to 1 over C times IC IA minus I1 minus I2. Aha. Good. Now let's represent this expression using the state space representation here. DVC DT becomes X2 dot because VC is X2. So this is X. This is X2 dot. 1 over C is a constant, IA is an input, don't need to change it, I1 is X3, and I2 is X1. And here we have the second expression for our state space representation. We are missing one equation. Now we are looking for an equation for the derivative of I1 as a function of other states. How can we do that? Now we could apply Kirchhoff's law to this loop and do the sum of all voltages there. If you do that, we'll see that this voltage across here will be a function of I1, because that's the voltage across the resistor, it will be a function of Vc, which is another state, and this makes things very convenient because the voltage across the inductor is also a function of I1, a function of one of our states. So if you now do Kirchhoff's law in this loop here, what do you have? We have that R times I1 plus the voltage across this inductor is L1 di1 aha, dt minus Vc equals to zero. Why minus Vc? Because the current through Vc is pointing down. So when you go clock or counterclockwise here, you are going against the current through Vc. Hence the negative sign. This equation is perfect because we have everything here as a function of the states. Now we can isolate di1 dt and di1 dt is simply 1 over L1 times Vc minus Ri1. Now we can write this in state space. di1 dt becomes x3 dot 
1 over L1. Vc is x2 minus R times I1, which is x3. Here we have the third expression for our circuit. Third state represented as a function, the third state derivative represented as a function of other states. All right, now we have these three expressions. We need to define our output. Our output here is VL, is the voltage across this inductor. Now we need an expression for the output as well. Let's write it here. How do we find that one? We want the output to be a function of the states, not the derivative of the states, just the states. Well, we can actually do the same Kirchhoff's law that we did here. The, the exact same, but instead of writing L, L1 di1 dt, this whole thing here is in fact vl, is the output. So we can reuse that expression and rewrite this as R i1, the voltage across the resistor, plus the voltage across the inductor, VL, minus VC equals to zero. So VL, the output, becomes VC minus R i1. In state space, or using the state space variables, we have VL equals to VC x2 minus r times i1 which is x3 and there it is that's the expression for the output okay. now that we have that i'm going to erase everything save these equations and you're going to represent them in a matrix format very well so here we are with all the expressions we derived before x1 dot x2 and x3 dot and VL, the output. The output, which is VL, that is the same as Y in the standard form for state space. Now let's write these equations in the standard state space representation. The first one will be X dot equals to A times X plus B times U. U is the input to the system, which is IA. X dot is X1 dot X2 dot x3 dot is a times x, x1, x2, x3 plus b times u, which is ia. What goes in there? So let's look at x1 dot. For x1 dot, we're looking at this expression here x1 dot only depends on x2 and has this coefficient 1 over L2. So this is 0, 1 over L2, and 0. Now let's look at x2 dot. x2 dot depends on the input, depends on x3 and x1. So we have for x3, uh, for x1 we have negative 1 over C, X2 is 0, and X3 is also negative 1 over C. We'll do the output later. So now let's complete the third row here. That's for X3 dot, and this depends on X2 and X3. So there is no X1, this is 0. For X2 we have 1 over L1. And for x3, we have negative r over l1. Now let's look at the input. The input doesn't show in x1 dot, this only shows in x2 dot. So for x1 dot, we have 0. For x2 dot, we have 1 over c. I will show here for this part of the equation. And for x3 dot, we have zero. Okay, so this is our first equation. Now we need an equation for the output. The equation for the output, which is y, will be c times x plus d times u. y is the output, is vl, which is c 
times x, x1, x2, x3, plus d times u, u is the input, i8. So what goes in these matrices now? Now let's look at the output equation. We have VL that depends on x2 and x3. It doesn't depend on x1, so the first element is 0. It depends on x2, the coefficient here is 1. And it depends on x3, the coefficient is negative r. We see that there is no input here, there is no IA. So matrix D is simply 0. And here we have the first and the second equation. And this is the state space model for this particular circuit.